Buonasera, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Cucina Quarantena. Uh, tonight, we're going to go back to our roots of this little experiment in uh, live Facebook streaming, and we're going to be cooking Sicilian tonight. So, uh, what we're going to be making is a fresh pasta called buziate, and we're going to make a, a sauce to go with it called pesto trapanese. So, this is a dish that's really common in Trapani, which is the uh, west coast of Sicily. And I've had it many times. Actually, when the kids uh, and I, this sum past summer, last year, rented a cottage uh, near Trapani, this was one of the dishes we made because we could go to the grocery store and they just had big tubs of that sauce that you could buy and you could quickly make your own pasta. So this is gonna be a fun and easy thing to make. Uh, so I've made my uh, pasta dough in my bread machine. So again, the pasta dough recipe is um, one and three quarters cups of flour, two eggs, and then probably about a quarter cup water, it's depending on how uh, moist your environment is, uh, and you add it slowly until it's the right consistency. And this consistency right now, it's the same as my earlobe. So just remember when you're making dough, it's ready when it feels like your earlobe. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this rolled out. I have this KitchenAid pasta roller, which I think is the best thing. It's, this is the bee's knees right here. I had this a long time, but they still do make this. So I'm going to start on the lowest setting, which is one, and just start feeding this sucker through here. This is such a relaxing activity. Anybody who's feeling frustrated about the world in general needs to learn how to make pasta because pasta making is just like, it feels good, but it's so rewarding. And even if it turns out ugly, it'll still taste good. And that is all that matters, is that it still tastes good. And there we go. So what I do on this is that I um, run it a few times on zero, or one I guess it is, which is the lowest setting, until it kind of comes together. <laughs> yep. It's like bubble wrap. Everybody loves popping the bubble wrap. Okay, so now that it's about the right consistency, it's coming in it like an envelope, and I'm going to put it in perpendicular. You guys have seen this before if you watched one of my very first episodes. This is the, one of the first things that we did was make pasta for everybody. Now, theoretically, I should probably turn this a few times in that same way that I did, like the envelope style, but in the interest of brevity, we're just going to go go for it and I'm going to just keep rolling this out. What I'm going to aim to do is make a slightly thicker pasta here than I would if I were making a regular, a regular fettuccine. So um, I want it to be kind of chewy. So three is the setting I'm going to finish on. And three is going to be pretty thick. I wouldn't make a fettuccine this thick. But you need to make this a little bit thicker. switch it for the fettuccine maker. and all this does is cut it. You can use a knife too if you want, but we're going to be professional. We're going to be extra special cool and we're going to use the cutter. And this is pretty simple. So baking of the pasta itself, the basically made the dough. So the only thing I'm spending time on here is just this. So once you see how easy it is to make pasta, you'll want to make it more often. And it is actually a lot better. Fresh pasta is a lot better than the box kind. All right, so we're going to come over here to my little workspace. And this is where we turn the pasta from fettuccine into buziate. And buziate is a name, apparently, that comes from the name of a plant in Sicily. And that's because when this was invented, what people did to make this shape is they would wrap this, the long pasta strands around the branches. And so it, it would give it its unique shape. So this is something I don't think I've seen outside of Sicily. So it's a, it's a local dish, but very easy and very festive. That's why I like this. It has a, a real festive look to it. Nico, you want to come help me? Coming. Coming. All right, Nico and I have been practicing. And I think we've learned some, uh, some tricks. All right, 
You got a chapstick around the house? <laughs> Buona sera, Nico. <laughs> <laughs> He's always very festive. All right. Come on, join me over here. I got, I got your chapstick here. Yeah. All right. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the fettuccine strands. I'm going to run one side of it through some flour. And the flour is going to be, the flour inside is going to face the chopstick. Now, Nico and I both kind of developed different techniques. That's why I wanted uh, him to help. So the way I'm doing it is I'm going to go to the tapered side of the chopstick. I'm going to put the pasta and I'm going to press down. And then I'm going to roll and overlap it and press down. And so you see, I've, I've kind of sealed it. And now that I've sealed it, all I need to do is just twist, 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 twist. And I, you want to make them about that long. So now that I've gone twist, 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 I'm just gonna chop it with my fingernail, squeeze a little bit, squeeze, squeeze, and then I'm gonna roll it right off of the chopstick. And if the cooking gods are with us, it will hold its shape. Ta-da! And then you just roll it in the flour, okay? So that's pretty much all there is to making this shape. Here's the way I do it. Yeah, Nico's gonna show you. Well, first, what I do is I dip my, the tip of my chopstick in water. And why is that? So that it's easier. Uh, so that it's easier when you put the pasta down on it to kind of glue it on there because the flour kind of fuses with it. And later, when you're taking it off, don't uh, don't hesitate to just kind of rip this bit off. This is the. It looks like making bottle rockets. It's fun. It is fun. Yeah. This it's kind of relaxing. It's very relaxing. It's like a craft project, but one that you eat. So this would be a really great pasta shape, I think, if you were to have like a pasta making party. So I've done a little bit longer one. It's kind, of a, it. it's kind of a festive pasta, like you could serve this at Christmas. Or a birthday party too, because it looks to me like birthday ribbons, like the ribbons that go on top of a birthday present. The only thing that I want from now on on, on Christmas is the uh, tortellini uh, in brodo. Oh, the, from uh, Palermo. Yeah, that is really good. I started making that. I think you guys, I might have told everybody out there that's what I did for Christmas Eve dinner this year. I made homemade tortellini and a homemade broth. And we had tortellini all in Brodo, which is a really popular dish in Palermo. Casa del Brodo. I miss here's eating my, there. Here's my pasta. Beautiful. And you just want to toss it in the flour. It should be a little tighter than that. Yeah, I realize that one's a little bit... Okay. And you can get real fast at this. I think that, uh, you know, the kids and I made these this afternoon, and after you get rolling with it, it goes after really you fast. Get rolling with it. Rolling with it. Oh, that's terrible. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, the puns. We are a pun oriented family, are we not? Yeah. So, what you have to do with this is because it's a fresh pasta, but we want to have it hold its shape. After you've made a whole bunch of it, what you want to do is uh, spread it out on a cookie sheet like this and then put it somewhere warm. And that can be just in your kitchen if you want. I actually went because it was sunny today and I put the tray out in the sun. You sure it's not going to be eaten by the crows? It was not eaten by the crows as it turns out. No? That's surprising. I know. We have some very determined crows in our backyard. Yes, we because do. we've been putting our cat food outside because yeah. it's stinky. That's a much better one. There you go. That's a nice one. So the good thing to do before you take it off the chopstick is just kind of squish with your hand and make sure that it's actually formed. See, we keep all the chopsticks that are extra for when we get Chinese takeout, so it comes in handy to have chopsticks as a tool in the kitchen. And you just kind of roll it around the flour. And then this stuff, you just would like, you can just set it out, let it dry, you can do it the day before, and then you have it all ready to go whenever you have people over. Uh, like I said, I did this on a number four setting on the pasta roller. You could do it on a three, and I did do some of it on a three, but just in terms of trying to get the, the genuine texture, the kind of texture you get from Buziate when you're in Sicily, it's a little bit of a chewier pasta. So that's why I set it on a slightly higher number uh, this go around, because the texture should be something, yeah, kind of chewy. And if it's too thin, it'll be a little too delicate and it won't be, um, it won't be the way it was intended to be. This is very fun. You really should try it. And the thing that's nice about this is that so many pasta shapes, people can do really fast 
if they are good at doing it. You know, like orecchetti, the little ones that look like ears. I'm terrible at those. But, uh, or strazzapetti, I'm not good at those either. But this takes no skill and turns out impressively pretty, doesn't it, Nico? Yeah, it really does. So Nico's making an extra long one. What I would probably do is make it that long and then dry it like that and then break it in half. The only thing is once you make it that long, it's a little tricky to get off, isn't it? Yeah, it's probably gonna break in half anyways. Yeah, probably. All right, so Nico, you go ahead and continue working on this. Uh, and I'll, I'm gonna show people what our earlier efforts got us. So here is the completed uh, Buziati that we made earlier. So they're very pretty and they're very delicate. Uh, so some of them are, are much thinner pasta, some of them are thicker, but Buziati should be, this is a really good example. That's exactly the way it should look. Just like that, a pretty tight curl. I uh, broke one. Oh no, Luca, you're fired. Oh no. So, anyway, okay, so we've got that done. Uh, we've got the water on to boil. So, next thing that we're gonna do, we're going to make- you have in your room, you're fired. <laughs> we're gonna make pesto trapanese. Nico, can you grab me some uh, tomato paste out of the pantry? Sure, just so I'm gonna So, um, what you need to do to make pesto trapanese is your- nice one. Sorry, everyone. Yeah, over here, dude, thanks. Okay, so what we're gonna do is uh, make pesto trapanese now. So Nico's gonna get us some tomato paste. What ingredients go in here are um, garlic. What? I'm just pointing the garlic. Oh, okay. <laughs> garlic, almonds, basil, pecorino cheese. Oh, I love pecorino cheese. Tomatoes, salt, and pepper. Thank you. Can you also get out the pecorino cheese out of the fridge? Uh, yeah. Thank you. So these ones have sprouted a Okay, I'm just gonna pull off the sprout and use them anyway. I should have just planted these in the garden. That would have been smart. Maybe I'll save that one. There we go. So, three nice big, thank you. Da -da -da -da. Three nice big uh, garlic cloves. Tomato paste, it calls for fresh tomatoes, but you're making a pesto, so why wouldn't you just start with a paste? That's my theory. And besides, I don't have any fresh tomatoes. So, we're gonna go with what I have, because as you remember, this is Cucina Quarantena. So, we're just going with whatever we got on hand. So tomatoes are not the main taste in this pesto, actually. It is the garlic and the almonds. So uh, almonds are a really common ingredient in Sicilian cuisine. So you're gonna see almonds and pistachios and a lot of things you're not used to seeing in Italian food. So we're gonna go back over here to our Vitamix, my favorite new tool in my kitchen. I just used this to make a banana smoothie and it was really good. Yes, it was really I just introduced the kids to malt powder. They had never seen malt powder before. Malted right. milk. So here we go. Three cloves of garlic, pecorino cheese. That's probably, I'm gonna use half of that. Let's cut that in half. And I'm just gonna start off by grinding these two together. Now you guys are gonna have to like close your ears at home because this is a noisy blender. Oh my goodness. really something. Oh, it smells so good already. Okay. okay. Smell. Oh my goodness. That, that smells proper like Italy. Yeah. So blanched almonds is what you're supposed to use. I don't have blanched almonds, so I'm going to use raw almonds and sliced almonds. What we don't want is we don't want salted almonds, salted roasted almonds, because they're going to be too salty. Um, so you want to use ones that don't have anything going on. Because you just want the almond flavor, not the saltiness. Do you so think I'm just doing approximate are you gonna eat that? Yeah. I'm just doing approximate amounts. So just like a handful of almonds, basically, three garlic cloves, and um, that was like a couple inches of pecorino cheese. You can play with this recipe and decide what you like and what tastes yummiest to you. So some almonds, 
And then I think we're going to put in a little bit of the tomato paste now. I, I need that, thank you. Oh, sorry. Right. I was using it to cut a slice of pecorino cheese so that I could eat it. Well, I don't want too much tomato in here, so I'm just going to go through a little bit to see. Because this really shouldn't be an overwhelmingly tomato tasting dish. Oh my goodness, it's a cat. And then... Hello, Isis. the basil in now and then add more of the olive oil and scrape down the blender really well. And as you can see this is coming together really fast and that's the nice thing about making pestos. Um, I also just wanted to let you guys know somebody had asked me maybe two or three weeks ago if I could spend some time teaching you guys how to make sauces. So in my garden my potatoes are almost done and so I'm going to replace my potatoes with arugula. So that's going to be another one of our upcoming shows we're going to do some arugula pesto. So this is just a couple handfuls of basil, more olive oil. You wouldn't believe how much olive oil I've gone through in the past two months. We cannot keep it in the house, it seems. All right, let's try to get this going again. <laughs> Stay. Oh yeah, see now that's the sound, the sloshy sound. That's the right sound. It should be sloshy sound. So the, um, they say that this pasta sauce was made by sailors in Trapani, just in the same way they say that the pesto genovese was made by sailors in Genova. And the reason was that they needed to make something that they could take out on the ships and they could eat while they were sailing and it lasts a long time. So you can make this and you can put it under olive oil and it would stay for a very long time. So that tells you that you could make a big batch of this, put it in a jar and put some uh, olive oil over the top and you can save it for a long time. Alright, I think we're done. That was pretty easy. Ooh, yummy. Oh, that smells so good. Yeah, I'm actually going to alter this a little bit because it does need more tomato as it turns out. Because it shouldn't, it sh the color should be sort of like a peach color. It shouldn't be too red. But it should be more red than that. So this is a couple, this is about a tablespoon of tomato paste. And let's try this again. This is different, by the way, than the recipes that you find online, because this is a little bit more of what you actually find in the truck. It's not like a fakey food and wine thing. That is a little bit more peachy. Pesto Trapanese. Luca, do you want to taste? I would. Ooh. 
Um, oh my goodness. Mm. Oh my goodness gracious me. Ooh, really good. I'm just gonna okay. take a little bit more. It's not spreading germs, guys, if it's in your own family. <laughs> All right. Pepper, Don't judge me, please. Here, a little bit of pepper and then a little bit of salt. Take a little break from my smoothie. Mm. It is delightful. Oh, that is really good. Yeah. It's like pesto, but like milder. Yeah, it's just a little different flavor. Too much salt in, but remember, always make your sauces, as I have noted a few times, slightly saltier than maybe you actually want them to be. I'm gonna adjust it with just a little bit more tomato. Okay, let's try this. What I like about this also is everybody watching this probably has most of these ingredients in their homes. Beautiful. Ah, oh, that's the color. Yes, we got the right color now. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I know this thing's like a jet. Alright, so it looks a little bit like, I don't know what, peanut butter? No, not quite. It doesn't taste um, like Let's see. It looks a little bit like really chunky Thai peanut sauce. A little bit. Well, that actually is going to be another show we do. Ooh, Thai peanut yeah, sauce. Thai peanut sauce and all the different ways you can use Thai peanut sauce. That's a, it's one of the ways is it's really good in pasta. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. like it. All right. I'm actually going to leave this blending just on a real low setting with a little more olive oil. Wait, before, Did before. I ever tell you guys that I, I cook Whoop. just by feel? <laughs> I'm probably not the best person to be teaching anybody how to cook because... I just know how to cook and I don't really, I don't know why I do the things I do. Um, this is being trained as a cook in Italy, that's what happens. Okay, we got rolling pasta water. Now here's the thing. Luca, can you join us over here? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Alright, so um, we are ready now to boil our bisiate. So I'm going to just go ahead and side and remember fresh pastas cook much faster. And uh, dry ones. So I'm going to really quickly jump in here and stir them around so they don't stick together. As I have said before to people, you can, if you want, put a little drop of oil in your water, if you like. That's really up to you. There's a lot of people who would never be caught dead doing that. Fresh pasta, though. Okay, look, you can already see it's starting to float to the top. So you know this is cooked when it just floats to the top. And look how pretty it is. It's, it's keeping its shape. That's the thing I'm really happy about. So I think I'm going to have a little bit of sauce. The sauce is perfect. Okay, let's just start with the plate out. All right. Wow, it really doesn't take any time at all. Yeah, no, it's really, really fast. And actually, I wish I had my little mesh. Where's the mesh strainer, do you know? So I do not know. I use one of those little Japanese mesh strainers sometimes when I'm using pasta if I just want to get a little bit out. Okay, look how quick that was. Oh, I think I might know where that is. That's, um, no, it's not in here. It's not okay. in here. Oh, I know where it is. What am I talking about? You do the dishes, so I would think you know where things are. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know anything. That's okay. Come on back. Oh. But I know where it is. Okay. All right, so we're getting into the top of the pasta pot now. So I'm just going to leave it here for a minute or two, and then it'll be fine. Luca, stop it. Yeah. And then we will plate this up. Some of them um, are kind of unraveling, but that's okay. If you let them dry longer, though, they'll hold their shape more. Oh, they're very pretty. Look at that. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and get our strainer. There's a lot of great things in Trapani that I really like, and Trapani is a, is a great uh, culinary destination because they have uh, things you, you won't find anywhere else, like couscous. Couscous is really typical in Trapani, and that is delicious. We can try making that some night too, uh, but the Trapani's couscous is especially good because they serve it like the pile of couscous with all the goodies like seafood and all of that, and then they serve it with 
a big ladle full of a broth and the broth is so good. I was taught how to, how to eat that. The waiters always come around and they think, foreigner, I need to teach you how to eat your couscous, which is really fun. Uh, but you have to pour a little bit of the sauce on and then you eat just a scoop, pour a little bit of sauce on like that. So the food in Trapanese is, is cool because it's unique. Um, they're really close to Africa. You can actually almost make out Africa on a clear day across the sea. Also, uh, Trapani was, uh, wasn't it uh, originally Carthaginian? It was, yes. Yeah. And it has massive salt flats. Well, no, not massive, but like they, they have a, uh, you know, they make salt, sea salt. Yes. All right, look at that. Doesn't that look like the prettiest little curly Q sort of pasta you've ever seen? I think they're lovely. All right, let's drain them and then we'll toss them with the sauce and clean them up. And I have a feeling my kids are waiting for me to be done because they're excited about this. This does look very, very good. You guys had this last summer, so you've had it before, just I haven't made it for you. Alright. Whoa, look at all the steam. It's cool. Oh, oh. Whoop. What? Oh, it's just that the pasta becomes unraveled a little. A little bit, but not really. Oh, yeah, look at that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, if we had dried them longer, they would have held their shape a little bit more. You see, some of them that are fatter hold the curly cue more. Like, that one's perfect. So, we, if, you, if we'd have dried them and made them a little bit fatter, they would have had a stronger curly cue look. But this is fine. They all taste good. They taste the same no matter what the shape is. Just a little bit of the sauciness. Okay, that's probably about enough. Awesome. And then what you can do with this is you can toss the pasta with this. The other thing you can do with pesto trapanese is put it on bruschetta. So you can take Ooh. a piece of garlic bread, for example, or sourdough bread. You can toast it and then put this on top. And it is delicious. All right, I'm going to do my little taster, make sure that I have made something worthy of all of you wonderful people watching out there, and I think I have. Let's give it a shot. That's so good. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. Highly recommend. Super easy. You've got all these ingredients in your pantry, most likely, and it's a little bit of Sicily, right? to your plate. So they would definitely not kick me out of Sicily for baking this. I mean, hopefully they will let me back in again at some point. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, so that's Buziate with Pesto alla Trapanese. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed watching our Cucina Quarantena broadcast for this evening. This week, we're going to have tomorrow on uh, Adventures with Sarah, we're going to have my friend Daniela Wedel, who is, uh, she lives in France, and we're gonna have our Monday coffee chat. And on Friday, we're going to be joined by Danielle Oteri, who is a scholar, and she's going to talk about uh, history and art and all kinds of wonderful things. And in the meantime, in the middle, we have zucchini blossoms outside. So <gasps> what does that mean, Luca? Fried zucchini flowers. Fiori di zucca ripiene. Uh, they're going to be stuffed fried zucchini flowers, and we'll make that probably on Tuesday. So have a great weekend, everybody, and we'll see you again uh, hopefully tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Uh, have a great night. Ciao. Yeah.